So this was the basic metaphor. Hmm? Since web pages and uh, other data sources uh, have a link structure, hmm? in, in the case of web pages, a direct link structure, so they look like graphs, we can try to, to use algebraic techniques that, that, are, that can be applied to graphs hmm? and see whether something interesting happens. That is the idea. And one of the, ma the, main, meta the main metaphor, actually, in this case, for web pages, at least, for the web, is that we can think of an in-link to a page as a vote. OK? So very often, metaphors are behind very good ideas for, for algorithms. Sometimes, no. But in some cases, they, they can really be powerful if the metaphor is natural and captures some important aspects of the problem, they can really uh, provide a lot of insight. In this case, the metaphor is whenever I add a, pay, uh, a link to some page, even a spam page, I am declaring some degree of interest for that page. Hmm? So why shouldn't we leverage this? So the idea was, was trying to argue in the following way. Let us assume that every page already has a score associated, which we call pay rank, rank score for the moment. Not page rank, rank score, okay? We call it a rank score. So, if a page has a rank score, how could I, I think of the, uh, what is the weight that, it, that is transmitted to another page by, my, by, uh, by a vote? Okay, for example, in this picture. <clears throat> so this, pa uh, this page J has three outgoing links, right? And we said that every link counts as a vote, right? But you don't want a person to give 10,000 votes, right? It is not fair. So if I give two votes and you give 200,000 votes, maybe, how should I say, the weight of my vote should be a bit smaller. The weight of each of the votes I give should be a bit smaller. You, you see my point? Hmm? So it is like saying uh, it is like having two persons, uh, one who is giving very high judgments always, and another one who is much more careful. Right? She will only give a good judgment where, uh, if she really thinks this is the case. So in the case of links, if we look at them like votes, if I have a page with ten thousand outgoing links. Maybe the weight of each of those votes in proportion should count less than the vote given by a page that only has a few outgoing links. You see what I mean? Hmm? Again, this is not a mathematical theorem. I mean, it's uh, just uh, an intuition which we then try to formalize in some way. And how is this formalized in page rank? It is formalized in uh, the following way. Let us uh, assume that every page has some rank score that we will have eventually to compute, how is the rank score of this page distributed across the different pages that are pointed by the page? The basic idea behind page rank is that it should be split equally, okay? Unless you have good reasons not to do so. Hmm? Hmm? Again, this is not the Bible. Uh, you can come up with another uh, model that, uh, that is founded, that is solid with respect to the application and so change this model. But unless we have other uh, information, a good idea is to equally split the vote, so the weight of every page among the pages it points to. And this is the idea of this formula, you see? So the rank of J is given by the rank of i uh, divided by 3 because i has 3 outgoing links plus the rank of k divided by 4 because k has 4 outgoing links. Okay? That's easy. So, and this looks like a flow equation. You remember? Whatever enters the node leaves the node. Hmm? 
And there is a, a lot of theory behind the flow equations, I mean, how to solve them and so on. Uh, this is just the equivalent formulation, right, as a sum. So there is not much to add about. The only thing that you, you should note is that you, if you have a graph with a certain number of vertices, like three in this case, for every node you will write, we, you will be able to write down a flow equation like those ones, and you have no constants. So this means that you have a homogeneous system. Homogeneous systems normally have infinite solutions, right? So you could find infinite vectors of scores. How do you decide? Well, one way in which you decide is to consider one form of normalization, imposing that the total rank should be one. So if you sum up the rank scores of all the vertices, you obtain one. Okay? Yes, uh, that is the assumption that is done in page rank. When we go to the uh, Markov formulation, we will also understand why. What is important is that if you have positive scores, these are all positive scores, right? There are no negative coefficients, so they will be <laughs> positive. I mean, if you, rank, if you rank sum to one and they are positive, they look like probability distribution, right? So already now you can think, hmm, this may look like a probability distribution. Is this important or not? Well, it is. We will see later why. Uh, what I wanted to add is that the moment you do a normalization, <coughs> that means you impose that the sum of the, of the um, rank scores is one, now you are in a position to solve the system, in principle. Hmm? Because at this point, you can apply standard linear algebra, Gaussian elimination, all these type of things to compute a solution. Uh, there is a number of questions which are left open. Can we always solve this? Um, is the solution that we get always, um, how should I say, has it an intuitive meaning? Does it make sense? We don't know yet. Hmm? We'll have to see. Another thing we uh, were looking at last time was the following. We can actually represent that system of equations uh, using a, a linear algebra representation, right? So either we have a, a matrix M in which the rows entries, sorry, the, the column entries sum to one, like here, and you remember why they have to sum to one, yes? Because I'm simply splitting, good. Or we can write, we can write it like this, Let's call this A. Hmm? Or we can write it like this. So very often, so people who, who do link analysis tend to write it in this form. Hmm? But it, they are perfectly equivalent. They are equivalent if you remember that you should take the transpose of M when transposing. Okay? You have to transpose everything. Um, in that case, th this matrix will be, so if you write the equation in that form, this matrix is stochastic, uh, I mean stochastic. The sum of the rows hmm, should be one, unless it is zero. We will see why it could be zero. Is this clear so far? Hmm? Good. Then what we had seen is another thing, which was the following. <coughs> if you look at this equation, or that equation, equivalently. That equation is telling you that actually the vector R that you eventually compute is, a, is an eigenvector of the matrix, right? The eigenvalue is one. You see that? It's just the definition of an eigenvector. Yeah, what is an eigenvector? You apply the matrix to the vector and you obtain the same vector. That's an eigenvector. In general, you obtain the same vector scaled by some, some scalar, right? Well, in this case, there is no scaling. So, if the, the system that we, of the flow equations admits a solution, in that, what you're going to find in that case is an eigenvector of the matrix. Is this clear? Huh? If a solution exists. So, how would I compute such an eigenvector? 
There is one way uh, to solve eigenvec uh, to solve eigen uh, to find the main eigenvectors of a matrix, which is called the power method. Actually, it can be used also to find the successive eigenvectors. Hmm? But for now, we are interested in the main eigenvector. That's in, that will be enough for us. And the idea is the following. You start with any vector, with any initial vector, and then you iteratively apply the following equation. So t means time step. In every time step, you compute the product between the matrix and the vector you computed in the previous step. Hmm? Starting from a vector like this, or another one. And then you stop whenever this condition is met. Now, it should, I should make clear at this point that I'm, uh, the moment I'm giving you this algorithm, I'm making some implicit assumptions as to convergence, for example. I'm assuming that the system will converge that are not always true. Why am I doing this? Because the page rank modifies the adjacent, uh, let's say, the transition matrix of the underlying graph in such a way that the conditions I'm assuming are always met, okay? That is why I'm just very, so let's, let's put it this way, a mathematician at some point here would stop me and say, mm, are you sure this is satisfied? Mm, what happens if two eigenvalues of the matrix have the, say, the largest eigenvalues are, uh, have, are the same or they have opposite signs? I'm assuming that we are in a case in which it is not going to happen. Is, it, is that clear? Okay. And uh, since the case I'm assuming includes all the cases we're interested in, I'm proceeding, it, I'm proceeding in this way. I will then uh, more rigorously show you why this is the case. Okay? But for now, this is the standard power method to compute the main eigenvector of a matrix. And uh, is it going to converge in some way? Yeah, typically it is going to converge. And we also saw the reason why it is going to converge, which is contained in, in this slide and actually also in the book, which I invite you warmly to take a look at. Uh, in this case, in, it is the massive data sets book. Actually, you find the convergence of the power method virtually in every graduate or even undergraduate book in computers, in uh, algebra, let's say. Okay, in linear algebra. Hmm? And... Uh, so the idea was that as you take the successive powers of the matrix, which is the same as multiplying the matrix iteratively by the last vector you computed, eventually the, the term that is going to be dominant is the first one, okay? Is this always true? Well, actually it depends. If this is the largest, uh, so if the eigenvectors are, let's say, sorted in descending order, so this is the largest one. This is true unless, for example, this other one is equal to this with an opposite sign. Can this happen? Yes, it can happen sometimes, but the page rank avoids those cases, okay? By manipulating this matrix before application. Um, do you remember these points so far? Huh? I'm not going to go over them completely. So, this uh, was essentially the, the point uh, which we reached last time. And now, we have to understand, to ask a, a number of questions. The questions are the following. This is essentially the power method. The first question you can ask is, does this converge? What, didn't you just show us that it converges to the well, uh, I told you that if the largest eigenvector in modulus is actually the largest, so there are no other ones that are as large in modulus, well, yes, then that is the case. Eventually it converges. But there could be cases in which this does not happen. So you have two eigenvalues, for example, with the, the largest eigenvalues in modulus have opposite signs. In that case, what is going to happen? We will see. Another question is, well, does it converge to what we want? What do we want? Yeah? What do we want? I mean, does it converge to what we want? What does it mean? Can you express some desirable properties for the vector to which it should converge? Hmm? 
what should this vector be like to make sense for us? It can sum to one that is up to us. I mean, defend, depends on how we define it, yeah. Let's say we would like to have, for example, perhaps non-negative components so that uh, we can use it to score the, the vertices. Hmm? You know, because if you have a, um, a positive, what is more important? A small positive component or a large negative component in the vertices? That's hard to tell. So maybe if the vector is just non-negative, if all components are non-negative, it's easier, right? Um, are the results reasonable? What does it mean the results are reasonable? For example, I run this process and then I discover that I had one billion pages. One page gets a rank score of one, all the other pages get zero. Mm, that's a bit ugly, right? Of course we found an important page, I guess, but <laughs> Can it be that the others count zero? Okay, so, and this is the very point where uh, random walks and Markov chains enter the picture. Because Breen and Page had exactly these very problems. So there is the famous page, uh, paper from 1998 and follow-up uh, work in which they actually tried to address these, these very problems. Hmm? Because they were running simulations and sometimes they were getting very interesting results, sometimes not. So sometimes the, all the mass of the page ranks seem to fall on just one node, for example. Mm, that's ugly. Or sometimes they had a problem represented by the fact that you had only incoming edges, incoming links, no outgoing links. What is going to happen in that case? That's a serious problem. Okay. And so that is how page rank came to to, to light, because in order to understand what, uh, what these problems were coming from and how to fix them, they had to re revisit these very equations in a different perspective, so as random walks. You know what a random walk is? Ever heard of a random walk in your life? Please, please give me feedback. Yes or no? It's, a, it's not a shame yes. if you never heard of it. Yes? All of you? Oh, no, okay. Markov chains? All of you heard, at least heard, you have an idea of what a Markov chain. Great. That's enough. Skeptic, yeah, you heard of Markov chains? You heard or you didn't? Yes. Heard, only heard, good. Now, let's try to look at the problem in a different way. So, let's go back, uh, let's go back to, to a graph, and, uh, and now let's uh, try it. Let us now try to give a probabilistic interpretation. So, uh, let us assume that every page is a node of a directed graph, hmm? and that we have what is called a random surfer. So it, it is a very simple model of one person surfing the web. You know, you start with a page that's before the era of search engines. So now you look up in Google what you need and then you follow the links. No, let's step back 15 years ago or more. You're sitting there, you start from a page and in this page there are a few links. Then you follow the links and so on. Hmm? So imagine a random surfer that does this all the time. Okay, let us assume that the random surfer is a bit naive. So, whenever he's on a web page, she will just follow one of the outgoing links uniformly at random. Hmm? Okay, and then you ask the following question, uh, the following questions. The first question is, if I start in some node of the graph and I look uh, where the random surfer is at some time t, after t steps. What is the probability that the random surfer is at any other specific node of the network? This is the first question. The second question is the following. If I just run the process long enough, hmm, one billion iterations, a hundred billion iterations, 
how frequently do I find the random surfer at every page of the graph? You see that? For example, why am I asking this question? Because if, for example, there are some pages where the where, uh, random surfer tends to be more often than others, maybe this is, could be an indication that those pages are more important. I mean, they're more central. You tend to finish onto those pages more frequently than, than on others. You see that? Huh? Th this could be a reasonable way to rank vertices of the graph. You see what I mean? Hmm? So, let us begin with the first question. Let us take uh, one particular note, i. Hmm? What is the probability that uh, I am at node i at time t? Okay, or time t plus one. Let's call this probability like this. Oh, but that is the same symbol you use for the rank score. Yes, it is the same symbol. Hmm? I am using the, yes. The, the what? What is R? Uh, R. It is the probability that I am in this node of the graph after t steps. So let's say that I start I'm, I started some vertex. It doesn't matter which vertex. Huh? Okay, I started some vertex in some initial state and then this guy moves in the following way. Whenever you are at one vertex you take one of the outgoing links uniformly at random, and then you iterate. So once I'm here, I will follow these two links with the same probability, so one half. Hmm? Okay, here one fourth, and so on. Now the question is the following. What is the probability that I am in this node after t plus one steps? And I'm calling this probability ri t plus one. So notice that I'm using the very same symbol that I used to denote the, uh, the rank score of a vertex, yeah? So before you say, ah, that's a symbol of overloading. No, it is not, we will see, huh? because it is equivalent to the, other, to, the other, to the rank score. Let's see why this is the case. What is the probability that I am here at time? So, to be here at time t plus one, I have to be here, here, or here at time t, right? You see that? Hey, you see that or not? Yeah. Good. So, if I am here, so all these have outgoing links in general, if I am here, then the probability that uh, at time t, then the probability that I am here at time t plus one will be equal to what? Before you write, wait. Let's say that this is J. So this means, you remember what this means. It's a compact way of writing, consider all the vertices for which you have a link from the vertex to I. Is this correct? So this is the probability of being here time t plus one if I was here at time t. Of course, I have to weigh, to weigh this with the probability of being here at time t. So, you see that? You agree with this? Hmm? And I am summing, these are all these joint events, because at time t, either I was here, or I was here, or I was here, or I was somewhere else, okay? And if I was somewhere else, to another, in another vertex that is not connected to this, there is no way that I can be here in the next step, correct? You see what I mean? Hmm? So, do you recognize this equation? 
it is the very same equation we wrote for the flows. Mm. And that's a very interesting. So we changed the interpretation. Now these are probabilities, but I get the very same equations. Aha. That's nice. I mean, it's a, it's a remarkable thing. Since I get the very same equations, I can also express them in uh, the very same matrix form, right? So I can write I can write this, for example, yeah? You see? Or if we want, we can write it in the opposite way. We can take the transpose. Hmm. Let us try to define this matrix once again. Or actually, can I cancel this? Can I erase here? So let us look at the matrix uh, MT such that Okay, what does this matrix look like? In order to write this matrix I have to look at these equations. Hmm? Okay. So, hmm. so let us try to understand what this, what this is telling us. So, this is this is actually, if I consider here, for example, R, um, this, hmm? Do, this will correspond exactly to this equation. You see that? Hmm? Exactly. You can verify it yourselves. But what is important, what is important to understand is that if I look at the i-th row of this matrix, what is the i-th row of this matrix telling me? This is one way to denote the i-th row of a matrix. You put a star to mean all entries. So this is a row vector, okay? Hmm? What does it look like? Uh, let's make an example, let's make the example a bit more, okay. Consider a vertex that has only two outgoing links, to vertex X and to vertex Y. Hmm? Okay. In this case, the row of this matrix will only have one half here, one half, uh, no. one half corresponding to W, otherwise zero. Okay, so the matrix the matrix exactly describes the outgoing probabilities from any vertex. Okay, why am I using the 
Why am I using the, uh, the row in this case? If you sum the rows, the row is 1. The sum of the entries on the rows is 1. Okay. So, what is... If you take a matrix, any matrix A, in which the rows sum to 1, it is called the stochastic matrix. Okay? And every stochastic matrix describes what is called the Markov chain. Now, the matrices, the stochastic matrices we are considering are special because the entries, the non-zero entries uh, on, a, on a row can only have one value. They always have the same value. Okay, so on a row of a random walk, of a, a, un, an unweighted random walk, we always have two values, zero and something else. One divided by the out degree. Okay, in a general random, in a general Markov chain, the entries can be any, as long as they sum to one. Okay, that is the difference. So, what is a Markov chain describing in general? The Markov chain is actually describing the process we have seen uh, so far, only in cases in which uh, the probabilities on the edges could be different than uh, just one divided the out degree. Okay? For example, here you could have one over three, two over three. Hmm? In that case, that is a random walk. And the random walk is a very interesting process. Sorry, a random walk, a Markov chain. In the Markov chain, you have something which we have called so far the random surfer that is moving from one state to the next <coughs> of, a, of a graph, of a directed graph, okay? Following the links with probabilities associated to the, uh, to the, link, to the links themselves. Hmm? Nothing more than that. That is called the Markov chain. And um, Markov chains actually represent a lot of very interesting, can be used as models of very, very interesting phenomena. I mean, they're used really uh, widely hmm? in advanced applications. I mean, they really, they're represented in areas that range from biology, meteorology, computer science, of course, physics, engineering, whatever you want, telecommunications. Hmm? They are really a powerful method. The characteristic of, the, of a Markov chain is that essentially the vertices of the graph represent, if they represent the state of a system, hmm? if every node is associated to the state of a system, in our case the state is a web page, the web page I'm currently visiting, the state in which you are at any given step only depends on where you were in the previous step. You see that? Hmm? For example, Assume that at any point in time, I'm in this state, in this page, okay? The state that I'm going to be in, in the next step, doesn't belong to from uh, being here or being here two steps back, right? You see what I mean? It is only important when, where I am currently, okay? Do you understand what I mean? Hmm? The set of possible states in which I could be in the next step only depends on where I am now. It does not depend on where I was before. Hmm? This is called the Markov property. Okay? And random walks are spe special case of Markov chains. So the random surfer model is essentially a random walk on a graph that corresponds to the web. Simple. That's the random surfer model. You take the web graph Every hyperlink is a directed link, every node is a page, and then you imagine that a random surfer starts at some initial web page and then follows the links randomly. And you ask, where is the surfer going to be in uh, 10 steps, in 100 steps? That's the question. And it is a mark of chain, a special, of a special kind. Hmm? A special kind which is called a random walk. Okay, so we, you should, we should have in the course in probability that you take in the second year, I mean, there should be something on Markov chains. And this is, a, this is a gap which needs to be filled. So, notice another point. Intuitively, you see, mm, 
look at this equation. Hmm? Okay. I'm not going to show this now, but I will eventually show this. If this is a probability distribution, which means that if you sum over j, all the rj's, you get one. This is also going to be a probability distribution, unless something bad happens. I will come back to that, OK? So if your matrix is not, for example, a matrix with zero rows, I mean, it's not a stochastic matrix. If M is a stochastic matrix, this is always going to be a probability distribution. So you jump. So essentially, this gives you the probability distribution of, of finding the random self uh, in any given node at time step t. And this gives you the probability, the new probability distribution, the next step. Hmm? It is just way, a way of computing the probability distribution at time t plus 1 from the probability distribution at time t. Hmm? That is what a random walk is doing. And actually, that's what a Markov chain is doing. You apply the transition matrix, so the stochastic matrix that describes the Markov chain, to the current probability distribution, and you get the next pro the probability distribution in the next step. Hmm? You iterate over and over. So this is a very interesting perspective, because you, you remember we be we began with the flow equations, but they yeah they have some intuition, but they uh, it's flows. What does it mean? I mean the boat is flowing. Yes, these have a very clear interpretation. Hmm? Now, the rank scores have a very clear interpretation. So you can look at them as pr the probability distribution of a random surfer navigating the states, which in our case is the set of web pages of a given Markov chain. OK, that is the meaning of the rank scores. Uh, but there is another reason why mm, Green and Page took this metaphor, because we know a lot about uh, Markov chains. In particular, we are able to say, to, to give sufficient conditions under which this equation will converge. And we, and we can also give, uh, give sufficient conditions under which it will converge to something that makes sense, huh? something that is reasonable. Let me see if I said everything I wanted to. So. Mm, yeah, I did. Uh, I don't promise anything because that requires my time is always a bit <laughs> constrained, but I'll try to write a couple of notes with the most important uh, notions about Markov chains. Mm. I mean, I should assume that you know enough about, but since this may not be the case, let's say the very basics of Markov chains huh? that we are using. Uh, anyway, there is a lot of, lots of references about. I can give you a few references as well if you want. Actually, I will give you some references as well. OK. Um. So here I'm giving you an ugly Markov chain, an ugly random walk. Hmm? But let's, uh, le let's before give uh, some, a couple of definitions that may be useful in uh, the remainder. Hmm. Now consider any Markov chain, hmm? any Markov chain. So you have the prob some probability Pij of going to from i to j, some probability Piw, of going to i to w, some probability pjk of going to, to j to k, pw j, so if the, these probabilities on the, out, if probabilities on the outgoing edges are always the same, for example, one half and one half here, 
This is the random, just a random walk. In general, they can be different. The only important point is that mm, Okay, for the outgoing links, if you sum the, outgoing, the probabilities on the outgoing links of one vertex, they should sum to one. So for the moment, let's put, okay, so this will, should, should be one, cannot be anything else. Okay, that's the only condition. In that case, you have a random wall, uh, a Markov chain. Now. Um, we can define a variable that tells me uh, in which state, so in which node of this graph, I am at time t. Okay? Hmm? So, Okay, so very often the nodes in, when you speak of Markov chains, you call the nodes uh, states. And uh, this is the general definition, uh, I mean the general uh, terminology used. Also because Markov chains, as I was telling you, can dis in general describe system, the behavior of stochastic systems. Hmm? And, and systems have states. Okay, our system is a random surfer who is visiting web pages. So our states are web pages, but in general they can be anything. So, if I define this variable, then please check that this makes sense. Hmm? Okay, this is just a probability that the state is j at time t. Okay, again, if I am representing this, you see this is a graph, right? This is a graph, a weighted graph. So I can represent, associate to this graph, a matrix, which I have called uh, MT. Hmm? Okay, you see that? So, if you associate this matrix with, which I called MT, then you will obtain the following equation. If instead you define the matrix in a different way, Okay, this becomes PJI, what I have called PJI here. And this equation you write differently. Hmm? I would ask you at home to just verify these things alone. I mean, that it doesn't require any expertise. You just have to sit down there and convince yourselves. Huh? I cannot convince you more than you can do by yourselves, okay? So please check this. But if you check this, you will verify the following. Um, now, why was I showing you this? Because we can ask a number of questions.
So let's start asking a, number, uh, a couple of questions. You remember that the main questions we had uh, were these questions. Does this converge? Does it converge to anything reasonable and so on? Consider this example. Do you notice anything here? Is it going to converge or not? No, right? Let us say that you begin here. So, oh, but you told us, you told us oh, this. That's wrong. Yeah? You told us that, I mean, I told you this, look. So, that is not what should happen here. This is infinitely proceeding like this. So, that is wrong, is it? Hmm? Look at the following. What are these? These are the eigenvalues, right? How do we compute the eigenvalues of a matrix? And what is the, the matrix in, that case, in uh, this example? The matrix in this example is this. Uh, should be blah, blah. Yes. Yes, this is the matrix in this example. You see? If I'm here, let's say A, B. A, A, B, B. You see? If I'm here, I'm going there. If I'm there, uh, if I'm there, I'm going here. Uh, by, ah, sorry, 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 sure, of course. Yeah? You see that? That's a flip-flop. So, which are the eigenvalues of this matrix? Oh, it's easy in this case. Let's call this matrix... Uh, M, uh, A. Let's call this matrix A. Yeah, do you remember? To compute the eigenvalues, we need to... The roots of this polynomial, which is the characteristic polynomial, will give us the eigenvalues. Right? Good. Let's see what happens in this case. In this case, Yeah? Characteristic polynomial. Yeah? So, P of lambda hmm? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> That's the only case in which this is not working. Okay? Because what is going to happen here is that actually the last term, the eigenvalue, the last eigenvalue, the smallest one, is negative. But in absolute value, it is equal to the first one. So that's why it's flip-flopping. Eventually, this term becomes, not this term, it becomes C1 lambda k1 uh, x1 plus cn lambda nk xn, okay? That is the reason why you have a flip-flop, <clears throat> okay? So, we are learning something interesting here. And we are learning it because we are looking at Markov chains. We are looking at this as a Markov chain problem. And uh, the first thing we are learning here is that if you, whenever the graph exhibits uh, some form of per periodicity. You see that it's, uh, the Markov chain is periodic. So if you start in the state A, at even states, at, at even rounds, at even time steps, you can only be in A, 
while in odd rounds you can only be in B. You see that? That's called periodic Markov chain. That is a special case of a periodic Markov chain. So, periodic, periodic Markov chains, no good. Hmm? Now, let us see dead ends and sp spider traps. Yes? In this case, yeah. uh, there is no, I mean, it's not converging. What is happening is that if you take the frequency that is converging, the frequency with which you are at a certain vertex, that is actually converging pretty soon to one half. But the probability is not converging to a vector. What does it mean, uh, convergence? It means the following. We have not arrived at that. I will show you. Uh, it has to do with what is called the stationary distribution. So, uh, when I gave you the uh, equation uh, before, so, and we said, okay, convergence, it means the following, that as t goes to infinity, you have that RT is converging to some vector such that okay this is the meaning of convergence in this case you are converging to a vector of numbers what is the physical meaning of this it means that if you spend enough time and you ask where is the random surfer now? At some point, if you wait long enough, this probability distribution tends to be independent of time. So uh, uh, we say that the chain is mixed. That's, a, the, that's a, the technical term we use normally. So it means that if you wait long enough, the distribution of the matrix, the, the probability distribution for the matrix states will not depend on the initial state, and actually, it will not depend on time. Of course, if you, don't look at the random, if you don't look at the Markov chain, the moment you look at the Markov chain, the Markov chain will be in some specific state, and then you have to wait again before the, run, uh, the Markov chain mixes. You see what I mean? But if you do the following experiment, provided that the Markov chain has a stationary distribu distribution, you could do the following experiment. I start the Markov chain in some state, and then I turn the other, the other side, and I don't look at it, okay? Like an elementary particle. If you look at it, distribution collapses. As long as you don't look at, look at it, you have Schrodinger's equation, yeah? The wave function. So it's, it's much simpler. <laughs> so you don't look at the Markov chain, you turn the other side, you start the Markov chain, and then, the, the, let's say the Markov chain is in any state. So the idea of stationarity is that if you wait long enough and you ask, where is the, where is the Markov chain now? In which state is the Markov chain? If you wait long enough, the distribution will tend to become independent of time, of the number of steps. Hmm? How long should I wait? Well, that actually depends on the algebraic, on the eigenvalues of the associated transition matrix. But if you wait long enough, eventually this is going to happen. That is the meaning of stationarity. But stationarity is not always achieved. In that case, it is not achieved. In that case, you can wait endlessly, and at every point in time, you will exactly know, like in this case, where, this, uh, where the matrix, where the random walk is, or at least you will know that it cannot be in certain states, for example. Okay? Now, let's look at another serious problem which is the following one. Uh, oh, yes. OK, we can look at that picture. Now, what is going to happen in this picture, for example, is that this is a Markov chain. Hmm? The point is that if you end up in M, you stay there. You never move. OK? So, 
I guess it is intuitive that if you wait long enough, eventually you end up in, in M and you are stuck there, right? So from that point onward, you are always going to be in uh, that state, so the frequency with which you are in M eventually tends to 1. And not surprisingly, if you apply the power method to, set to the matrix that represents that Markov chain or that random walk, you get this. Yeah? A vector with just one, one, a 1. Is this reasonable? Not so much. Why? Because I could have a stupid static web page with no outgoing links and then one link that is just wrongly pointing to me and I get all the rank. Come on, is this serious? Okay, you see what I mean. Um, so, there is another case which I want to remove soon, which is, let's say, this one. What happens in this case? It is not exactly the same as that one. Mm, that one is a Markov chain. What is this? That is the case of no outgoing links. You see, static, a PDF, for example. You point to a PDF. Well, now PDFs also have links that can be, actually, it was not like this. I mean, at some point, a link uh, PDF evolved, so you can uh, actually uh, parse the, a, a PDF file and look for hyperlinks. But once, it would not be like that. It would be not be an OCR, for example. It would be a picture. If it is a picture, it's a static page. It's a dead end, right? And it is ugly because if I'm looking at the matrix M for, for the K row, um, let's say this is K, I have a row of zero. So this is not a stochastic matrix. Huh? All I've been saying is valid for stochastic matrix. That's not a stochastic matrix. That is something ugly you want to remove. So let's say something like this we are not going to accept. <clears throat> something like that, we have to see what it means. What does it mean in that case? Uh, it has to do with the notion of reducibility of a Markov chain, in particular. Let me check at the time. Uh, uh, I still have plenty of time. I will have enough time to, comp uh, to complete this part. I'm being a bit slow, but since you have not a serious background on Markov chains, it's better to spend more time now than having to recover afterwards. So, let us look at this example. Now, we can ask a basic question. Assume that I'm, I am uh, in some vertex i of the graph. Is another vertex, say, k, reachable from i or not? You, see my, uh, you understand my question? Yeah? This means, can I go from i to w? in a sequence of steps, can I? Yes, for example, I can go here, then I can go here, then I can go here. So three steps. That's the minimum. It's a random walk, so you don't know how long it takes. So if you, you should realize this is a stochastic process. If you run it, it may take, in very unlikely circumstances, one billion years, okay, before you end up here. The probability is very small, but it is non-zero. Is that clear? Um, good. Can I reach every state from any other state in this Markov chain or not? Let me see. I don't know. I think so, but, uh, well, uh, yeah, I would say yes. Hmm? Yeah? So, we say, uh, we have a notion of let's say, um, um, reachability between states of Markov chains. So we, st we normally say that, let's put a double cross. 
a, a double arrow. We say that I is reachable from W and vice versa. If there, is, there exists a directed path in the Markov chain, so in the graph that represents the Markov chain, from I to W and vice versa, and vice versa. So you can prove yourselves, it's easy to prove, it's really easy, that this relationship is actually an equivalence relation. You remember your first year of math, equivalence relations? They define a partition of, the, of a set. No? <laughs> Equivalent, symmetric, transitive. Yeah? And uh, you remember that? Good. Um, so whenever you have an equivalence relation, you can partition the, the ground set. In our case, it is the set of states into equivalence classes. I'll make it short. Whenever every vertex in the, Markov, in the graph that represents the Markov chain is reachable from any other vertex, the Markov chain is called irreducible. Hmm? Okay? If that is not the case, like this case, This state, once you leave it, it is no longer reachable, okay? In this case, in cases like this, the picture is a bit more complex. Let's say, uh, uh, in this case, you will have two classes. One consisting of these two states, because they are mutually reachable from each other. Well, I can make it a bit more complex, of course. Okay, like this. Huh? In this case, you will have two classes. One is these three states that are mutually reachable from each other. And another class is this, in which all states are pairwise reachable. You see that? So these are called irreducibility classes. And they are actually equivalence classes hmm? in, the, in the mathematical in the algebraic sense. Um, so, whenever you have a picture like this, hmm, and you try to apply the following equation, now I'm writing this as stochastic column matrix, the result of this equation depends on where you start. You see what I mean? So if you consider a random walk, for example, that starts here, well, actually, in this case, the outcome is always the same. If I start from here, for example, I start cycling inside this, this class, but eventually, I will, take this, I will take this link, first or after, it will happen, right? Whenever I take this link, it's gone. So I will always stay here. So if I applied this, uh, the, the power method here, I would, I would get a vector in which all vertices belonging to this um, irreducibility class have zero rank score, and all the rank score is distributed across these vertices. So it is like starting the, it is like starting the random walk from this vertex here. It's the same. Okay. So what happens uh, if we have only one, one class, like in this case? Hmm? What happens when we have only one class? So what happens is that all, ve uh, all vectors, uh, let's say that the vectors will have non-zero components. So I mean, the, the very bad thing that was happening before of nodes being given no importance at all, ceases to exist, but you can still have other problems like, like this one hmm? of periodicity, which is something we don't like very much. So what is a periodic Markov chain? It's a Markov chain uh, like this or more complex. So. Hmm. We say that a Markov chain is periodic, periodic, with a period, let's say delta, 
if and only if the following, uh, the following happens. There exists at least one state, hmm, call it J, such that we have the following. So, there is at least one state for which the following happens. You can only be at j at multiples of some number delta of rounds. In that case, delta is equal to 2, right? You see there? In that example, delta equal 2. Hmm? Either odd rounds or even rounds. In general, there will, be, there will exist a delta such that you can only be if you were, uh, it's important, this is, the condition in here is important. If I am at the state j at some time t, I cannot return to j before delta rounds, delta steps, or a multiple of delta steps. Okay? In this case, the chain is periodic. Whenever the chain is periodic, What happens in this case? The world ends? No, the world doesn't end. Normally what happens is that you have two or more distributions hmm? and uh, when you let t grow to infinity, you, you tend to be in one of those distributions at different time steps. Okay, that is what happens. But it's not something you like. For example, if we want to use this method to rank web pages, it means that the rank that eventually the ranking of a page changes with time, always. That's not something we can use to score pages, you see? And also there seems to be something very, really wrong in this idea. So we would like to give, the, because the idea, the basic intuition we have is that if you run a random walk sufficiently long and then you take the number of times that in average you spend on each page, so the fraction of the time that you spend on every page, this is a good measure of the importance of the page, right? So this is a good intuition. So we would like to reconcile this with the mass. Hmm? So these look like cases that you want to avoid because in some sense they, 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 they are math mathematically you have to take them into account. But in practice, if you want to use these methods to the purpose of an application, you should try to find some way to avoid them. How can we do that? Yeah. There is a number of ways to do this, and that is what is done in PageRank. So in PageRank, so the two boys started uh, trying to address each of these problems in turn. So let's begin with the spider traps. Okay? Uh, now, actually, that ends. So what should I do when I have this problem? What should I do? Hmm? I download it, you know, because that is not something you avoid. It is something that eventually happens. You are crawling the web, downloading web pages, storing the uh, link information. If I, if I download 40 billion pages, there will be some page like this, right? It's just a matter of statistics. What should I do in that case? In that case, the page rank idea is the following. I will add some outgoing links. So how is this uh, link going to be added? Should, should it be a self-loop? No. If you add a self-loop, once you are here, you are stuck here forever, right? So you want to avoid that. 
no self loops. What should I do otherwise? So if a link is just, uh, if every link is a, is a notion of importance, right? It uh, is a vote for other pages. Since this guy added no outgoing links, huh? so uh, the, the weight of each of the votes it gives should be very low, right? You see what I mean? Hmm? So we are artificially adding uh, outgoing links to a page that express no outgoing links. So we should at least give them a very low weight. How can I do that? You know what? We do this. And actually, at that point, we also do this. And uh, well, then we have to do this. And then we have to do this. And then we have to do this. So, a dead end is simply Inc is simply augmented with outgoing links to every other page in the web. In this way, I mean, it, this has two advantages. It's not a naive solution. It has two advantages. First of all, this page is not contributing in a biased way to the score of other pages, right? I mean, it's equally treating all other pages, including itself. Secondly, the waste that you find on these edges is very small because it, it is essentially one divided the number of web pages. So that's, uh, let's say that is the page rank uh, background. So, okay, you always get that, <laughs> that point. Um, and this is so. From now on, I will assume that we have no dead ends, okay? So we have to fix the other problems. Hmm? So we still have spider traps, yeah? We still have spider traps. This is a spider trap. No dead end, but a spider trap. How do we fix that? With spider traps, uh, we proceed in... With spider traps like this, we can proceed in a different way. I mean, whenever we have self-loops, uh, we can either add n minus one other links to all other web, web pages. So we demote the spider trap. Or we can do something different, which is actually what is normally done, which is a simple, genial solution. So we change the random walk a little bit. So you, do, you imagine that your uh, web server does the following. Whenever the, uh, the random surfer is, uh, at a one uh, is at one page, she does the following. Uh, actually, they call it beta. Normally, throughout literature, it is known as alpha, uh, what is called the dumping factor. Let's call it beta. Fine. That's fine. Anyway, with some probability beta, you follow the link at random. OK? With probability 1 minus beta, so sorry, you follow the links like we have, we have done so far. But with probability 1 minus beta, you jump uniformly at random to any other web page. You see what I mean? I mean, it is a, a bit of, uh, of a drunkard. Uh, you know drunkard, so just moving. You more or less follow the links. From time to time, you just wander somewhere else without any specific purpose. OK? So what is the idea behind? The idea behind is that if you do this trick, you are not going to get stuck here. How long am, am I staying here? Actually, this is a geometric distribution. In expectation, you're going to be here uh, one over, let's say, with uh, uh, to some random page, uh, roughly one over one mi uh, minus beta, hmm? more or less. A constant number of rounds. Normally, you pick, for example, beta to be 0 0.85, 0 0.9. Hmm? So after a few rounds, at most, you leave the spider trap. Um, that's called teleportation. Hmm? Yeah, it's a teleporting. Yeah, you, you suddenly go to some other page. Okay. Hmm? Well, 0 0.8, 0, no, no, no. 
is 0 0.9, you are following the links. So most of the time, you are just following the links, like we have seen so far. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, you are jumping at random. OK, uh, no, no, otherwise, yes, it would be too much, of course. Otherwise, it looks like a, just a random, uh, you know what it means, that all the pages are more or less getting the same rank score, of course, yes. So it doesn't need to be stuck. Every now and then, with a, slow, with a low probability, it just jump, even if it is not stuck. Absolutely. Okay. All pages, yes. All pages, you, at some point, you just jump. Hmm? A bit crazy. So it is clear that now the random walk that you obtain is not, no longer the original one. But the idea is that if beta is large enough, close to 1, it will be a close approximation of what you would like to have. If you had just removed the spider traps, uh, dead ends, and so on. Okay? And uh, why is this so important that you jump uniformly at random everywhere else? Because uh, if you think about now, uh, which is the minimum number of rounds to go from one vertex to any other vertex? If I make these modifications, it is one, right? Because with probability 0 0.1, 0 0.2, I might jump uniformly at random everywhere. So it means that with one, uh, with one, mm, I don't remember what is the English I, I used to know, but anyway, you achieve two goals with one move. The first goal you achieved is that you removed spider traps. The second goal you achieved is that you removed periodicity. The chain cannot, cannot be periodic anymore, right? So the period is one. I can be anywhere in one round, even with very small probability. So what are these? Uh, so the, the matrix is now, so the, the random walk that I obtain, or the Markov chain that I obtain, at this point is both irreducible you only have one reducibility class, and it is aperiodic. You agree? By the definitions we gave. So whenever a Markov chain is irreducible and aperiodic, it is called, called ergodic. Why do we want, uh, why, have you ever heard of ergodic Markov chain? Ever heard? Why do we care so much about? Because the following is true whenever the chain is Markov, whenever the Markov chain is ergodic. And we find page rank. Okay, that is the idea. Hmm? Okay, now you have an idea why we have page rank and why it is defined that way. So that this damn Markov chain is irreducible and aperiodic, which is ergodic. Then the stationary distribution always exists and it is unique. There is only one vector. There is only one vector that will, will solve this equation. OK? One norm. I mean, the one norm of a non-negative uh, vector is always equal to the sum. Eh? OK, so there is a, a number of other properties I'm not saying now. Uh, the matrix is stochastic, of course, and therefore the main eigenvalue is always 1. Uh, the main eigenvector is non-negative. Hmm? That is the only eigenvector with non-negative components. All the others can have mixed components. It sums to 1, and that's it. We are done. Now we can use the entries of this vector to score the, the, the pages. Hmm? Uh, now, of course, there is the issue of computing. 
R <coughs> using something like the power method. Uh, but there is a number of tricks. So um, before we do that, I will do this the next time. Hmm? It, needs, it needs some more time. So um, we just have to remember, I would like you to fix the following thing for the next time. We had an original matrix M, hmm? which was describing just the graph, the random walk on the original graph. Very often, you are not going to, to have these properties with that matrix, OK? So we need another matrix. So the first modification was The first thing what to do was remove the dense, so make this matrix stochastic. OK? So next time, hmm, we assume that the matrix we have is already stochastic. So if there was any dead end, we removed it. OK? Is it clear? So then we will see the following two things. How, um, how you obtain uh, this matrix from the original one in a matrix form, and how you obtain the final matrix that represents this. Okay? Because this will translate into another stochastic matrix, which is no longer the original matrix, but is similar. I mean, it's re strongly related to the original matrix. Okay? Hmm? And then, once we have this, we will see how we can compute the page rank in practice. Uh, because eventually we need to compute it. And the matrix representation is the right thing to look at. I mean, you need to, to look at it as a matrix vector multiplication. And, uh, but I, it's better if I stop here, because otherwise I begin with, otherwise I would have to go back. You know? So, yes. Sorry? Uh, the server, no? Yeah. Uh, it, ex it expects a, a new page and, you know, finds a new link, and an outgoing link, and follows it. Yes, so it can do two things. Yeah, Either no, but the, the, in the second case, when I jumped to another, to another page, I was wondering just, where is the link to this page retrieved? No, 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 I mean, when, uh, if, okay, there is two types of links, let's say the original ones that are really there, and then there are the ones that correspond to the random jumps. The random jumps don't exist. It is something that is added artificially. I mean, you don't really add them. You just remember that when you are uh, performing one uh, iteration of the power method, you have to do a certain things. We will see what in next lecture. That's all you do. But the new links uh, that correspond to random jumps, they don't exist in practice. So it also tells you that this is a type of operation that you can do once you have retrieved the graph. Okay. It's something that you do offline, okay? It is not something you do online. Okay. Online, you don't jump to a random page. No, no, <laughs> there is no way to jump to a, uh, to a uniformly chosen web page online. How could you do that? I mean, you're surfing the web, you have no idea. So the web surfer model is just a model, okay? It is not something that you can do really I mean, actually, there is some way to mimic it. Actually, there is an alternative way to compute the page rank, which is based on uh, uh, Monte Carlo sampling. We are not going to look into that, but it really corresponds to the uh, random surfer model. So there is a way of doing that, but that exploits uh, a property of the page rank uh, distribution. I, I don't know if I have the time to handle that. And in case it will not bar out the exam, it will be just for your curiosity or, or information. Okay, so I'm done for today. I think I'll see you to, uh, next Monday. So I, we have to finish with start, this stuff with the link analysis. Uh, only it's a bit delicate, so I cannot, run to, I cannot be too fast. Um, I recommend that you go over the material. Hmm? I mean, the slides to begin with and what is uh, about this on the books that we suggest, Espe especially Leskovec and uh, Ullman book. Okay, just mm, try to be aligned with what we have done so far. 
Monday we are going to close this part, I hope, and then we look at other things. So link analysis, link analysis is really used, not to compute, uh, no, not to build a search engine. I mean, come on, you, you, we don't build search engines. Huh? You, we are s full of search engines. But it is useful in uh, graph mining techniques. Mm, it has a lot of applications, so take a look. <laughs>